Welcome back, everybody. Today we are here with Dr. Andrew Chen. He is the Chief Medical Officer for the United States Nordic Sport. He's a team physician for the United States Olympic team. How cool is that? And a team physician for the United States Ski and Snowboard Association. Dr. Chen specializes in orthopedics and sports medicine and has helped care for several professional sports teams in addition to being a physician at Madison Square Garden in New York. So you're probably wondering, what's the connection between sports and mental health? Well, physical fitness is only part of what it takes for elite athletes and Olympians to achieve peak performance. So today, we get to hear some tips from Dr. Chen on what it takes day in and day out to lead a high-performance life. I am so excited for this episode. I can't wait to learn from him. Dr. Chen, welcome. Thank you. So just to like dive right in... Can you tell us what makes an Olympian and are all Olympians born with extraordinary talents or do they need to become elite athletes? Well, there's no doubt that all Olympians possess athletic prowess, but even among Olympians, true talent, like the kind that can't be learned or acquired, is rare. There was an interesting study reported by Dr. Gould and co-workers in the Journal of Applied Sports Psychology, and after interviewing a cohort of Olympic medalists, they came up with a list of 12 attributes that were common. These attributes, things like competitiveness, mental toughness, confidence, goal setting, etc., these are the same ones shared by those who succeed in any field. Even sport intelligence, or the awareness and ability to quickly analyze the field of competition and adapt, is something that is applicable to any field. Um, Interestingly enough, raw talent was not one of those attributes. So Olympians, like successful individuals in any field, really just take to the nth degree those attributes that we know are are necessary for success in any field. That is interesting and really kind of good to know because I think we all kind of wonder about these things. Are there like specific personality or like attributes that are common among Olympians that you found? Sure. So beyond those characteristics that we just discussed, there are two attributes that really stand out among Olympians that are are rather difficult to quantify or measure. Um, The first is that elite athletes have an amazing ability to pivot. That is, they can rapidly discern whether something like a training regimen is something that's just going to take more hard work and perseverance or determine that it's something that's simply not working for them and make quick changes to something that does work. The amazing thing is that once they've made that pivot, like a change of diet, Uh, they stick to it straight away. Uh, There's no easing into it. For them, it's like flipping a switch. That's something that most normal people are are unable to do or even comprehend. Um, The second is resilience. So many Olympians can recount a major incident or time of strife in their life, like dealing with the death of someone close or overcoming serious injury or illness that really galvanize their resolve. But it's their ability to take that pain and anguish and turn it into something positive, something that motivates, that really makes them champions. Once they've achieved this, it's as if any pain or setbacks that come their way uh, further fuel their determination. It's like another challenge to overcome for them. And that's unlike most normal people in whom such insults would really negatively affect their performance. Well, you just helped me realize and understand why I am not an athlete (laughs) or an elite athlete. I, I think it's really interesting to think about the pivot. I mean, it's fascinating, really, because I know we think a lot about change and how hard it is to change. And, you know, I, I think, and then we, we kind of always use that expression muscle memory. And when you think about both of those things, I know that, you know, if I'm doing my Peloton, I will just keep making the same mistakes over and over again. But I could see that, that an elite athlete would handle it differently, that they would realize, oh, I got to make this pivot and then keep it going. So that's really interesting. Yeah, it's, it, it is interesting. I had this uh, one athlete who came up to me and said that she wanted to make a dietary change. And I said, well, you should do the 30-day challenge, see if it's right for you. And she said, 30-day challenge? I'm going to change today. And I was like, <laughs> how can you do that? But she did it. She just bang, just like that. And she was on a different diet. It's, it's unbelievable when you see what these guys can do. It is so, so fascinating. And I think, and the, just the determination is just really, really something else. Have you found that Olympians or any kind of elite athletes, um, that they look or regard diet and nutrition as a critical part of their like kind of key peak for performance? 
Yes, absolutely. So sports nutrition is a field that has really morphed in the last several decades from anecdotal recommendations or level five evidence to a true science with level one data. In fact, it's such an inherent part of elite athletics now that many of my athletes, when it's time to eat, will say it's time to fuel. The good news is that there's a lot of information on the internet uh, about how nutrition can optimize performance. But as we know, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And that's where uh, people like sports medicine doctors, physical therapists, trainers, sports nutritionists, they're really important to help them synthesize this available data and come up with an individualized plan for them. So for example, the macronutrient needs, things like protein, carbohydrates, and fat, they differ greatly whether you're a power lifter that wants to maximize strength and muscle mass, or if you're a cross-country skier who needs to be lean and fit but still have endurance. Get another great point, right? Because that is we see that all the time too. If you're trying to lose weight, you know, there's, there's kind of certain things for that or build muscle. So it, it really isn't the same for everybody and everybody kind of has to have sort of a different type of, I guess, dietary um, regime. I'm curious if the athletes at an elite level, do they kind of get involved in these trendy diets where, you know, we're told, you know, eat high fat or don't eat carbs or only eat pineapples or do they get caught up in that or are they just that they they see right through it all? Well, so I covered Nordic sports in which in general, a low body mass index is favorable. Um, it's interesting to me that it's typically the younger, less experienced athletes that consume of what has been termed the standard American diet. Um, it's typically the more veteran, successful athletes that often independently come to the realization that things like meat will sit in their gut for hours or dairy will bloat them and make them feel full. And both of these can negatively affect their performance. And as a result, the more experienced athletes tend to gravitate to minimize meat and dairy and, and get their source of protein from non-animal sources like soy or nuts or legumes. Um, you know, that being said, yes, athletes, especially when they're coming back from the off season, will often diet to be in shape for this season. This typically involves some sort of drastic change like a crash diet with dramatic caloric restriction, or more recently, to your point, things like the keto diet. But this can actually work against them by inducing muscle loss as the body goes into what's called ketosis due to the lack of carbohydrates, which is the body's preferred energy source. So we tend to see this more in younger athletes who tend to yo-yo with their weight based on whether or not they're in or out of season. But we don't really see this in season as typically by then they're at their competition weight and they've come up with a, a dialed in nutrition plan. I now know that your physician that's followed the whole foods plant-based WFPB diet for many, many years. Tell us about it. Is it a vegan diet? Um, do you recommend that to Olympian contenders and professional athletes that you counsel? And if so, how come? So a whole foods plant-based diet is one that includes only plant-based foods, and it really emphasizes naturally occurring or as minimally refined foods as possible. It's similar to a vegan diet in that no animal products are consumed, things like meat, dairy, or eggs, but the underlying missive is different. So a plant-based diet is concerned primarily with consuming a healthy diet to minimize risk of disease such as cardiovascular disease or cancer. An added bonus is that a plant-based diet tends to be more earth-friendly and results in less animal cruelty. Uh, veganism, on the other hand, really emphasizes a lifestyle that is free of animal products whatsoever. So things like animal-based foods, leather, or even cosmetics that are animal tested or contain animal products. But its missive is primarily to eliminate anything that causes harms to animals. So, you know, to be clear, there's no research that shows that a plant-based diet can actually enhance their performance as compared with a standard diet, but there's ample evidence that exists to support that athletes can pursue a plant-based diet without hurting their performance with a carefully constructed plan. But at that level, at the elite level, most athletes have carefully constructed diets anyway. So it's really a choice by some athletes to eat cleaner, minimize inflammation, decrease risk of disease, and be friendlier to the earth and its inhabitants. Um, now, because a plant-based diet tends to minimize BMI, uh, it does tend to be su well suited to those sports in which being fit and lean is an advantage. But there are many examples of elite plant-based athletes in any sport, including those that emphasize size and mass, such as football or weightlifting. So when an athlete has decided to go plant-based, you know, I don't try to convince anyone to go plant-based to your point. Uh, but when they have decided to go plant-based, I'll work with those athletes specifically to uh, construct a diet that's appropriate for their needs. I just wonder, you know, when I think about these kind of food types of, um, you know, whole food, plant-based diets, 
What do you think about it? I mean, what about for elite athletes, but what about the rest of us? You know, is it something where you would say if you're young or if you're older, you know, is there a certain that and, you know, ages that it could be better for? And my other question as a as an orthopedic surgeon is, do you find, is there any connection between how people eat and their bone density or their bones or anything like that? Uh, so to the first part of your question, it's, it's something, the whole foods plant-based diet is something that can be pursued by people of any age. Um, it was a challenge switching my kids when they were young from a standard diet to whole foods plant-based. Uh, I, trust me when I say that's a challenge. Uh, it's, it's almost best if you could start by, start them off in life by eating clean because then they never really get a taste of sugary sweets and sodas and donuts and things like that. Um, in terms of things like bone density, it hasn't been shown to be negative for that. Um, you know, to your point about protein, I think there's still a lot that we don't understand about nutrition and how some people in some cultures eat very minimum or consume very minimal amounts of calcium yet have very low hip fracture risk like the Japanese population. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, but this is where a plant-based diet really has advantages over essentially all other ways of eating, disease risk management. I think most people think of diet in the context of weight loss or performance, and a plant-based diet can not only be effective in these regards, but also has so many other benefits. It's been shown to decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, hypertension, erectile dysfunction. Um, in fact, in the scientific peer-reviewed literature, there's only three methods that have been shown to be effective to reverse and even cure heart disease. Uh, a plant-based diet and two prescription medications, atorvastatin, which is Lipitor, and rosuvastatin, which is Crestor, both of which are prescription medications and carry the potential for significant side effects. They also don't give you the other added health benefits, such as decreased cancer risk. In fact, of the top 10 killers in the United States, seven are potentially modifiable by the plant-based diet. Uh, and, and now that you tell me that uh, there may be an impact on eating clean with mental health, I, I guess that's potentially an eighth if people aren't getting depressed because they're eating cleaner. Uh, but it also has been shown to be associated with lower greenhouse gas admission, uh, emissions, less animal cruelty, less deforestation, and it's much better with uh, the efficient use of precious resources such as water. So most importantly, it's just, it's a way of eating that's sustainable throughout life. And it's good for us. It's good for the animals. It's good for the world. I think we could all learn a lot by uh, exploring a plant-based diet. I, I'm so glad you're talking about this because I, I just think it's so important. And it I didn't even know how much of it. I knew it helped your, with your you know physical health and heart disease, but I didn't realize it was that profound. I think one of the things for people it's daunting is that we're, we get into habits, going back to how we started this about, you know, our physical exercise, we get into habits about how, what we eat and how we prepare it. And so I, I think, I don't know if you found this, that sometimes it's just having some fun and learning about new ways to cook with just, you know, a plant-based diet. And I know like for me, I was just, I, I was telling Dr. Chen, I live above a Whole Foods, but I go down, I just grab a bunch of vegetables. Every Sunday I do this and I just chop them up, add some olive oil and some salt and I just roast them. So I have a whole bunch of different colored vegetables of different, you know, whatever, all week long. And I'll just add that. Sometimes I'll add a little quinoa. Sometimes I'll add some tofu. I mean, just, I always mix it up, but it's so easy. But I think people think, think that they've got to do these complex recipes and it's so much work and um, or that it's so expensive and it really doesn't have to be. So I don't know if, if you have found that, but I think sometimes just challenging people to just try it or they think if I don't eat protein, I'm going to be hungry. I heard a lot of people say that. And I'd say like, just try it because really, I mean, you know, vegetables and a plant-based diet is very filling. It, it is. And, and you know, in the beginning, so we've been plant-based for about eight years now. And in the beginning, it was sort of a, geez, what are we going to eat? Um, and there are um, some subscription services, for example, where, you know, you get all the ingredients all cut up and everything. Uh, and when, when you make them, it does make a nice meal, but you realize that they are very complex recipes. We no longer be, belong to any of those. That's sort of what 
kicked us off. And, and now it's actually fun. We'll each have a glass of wine and we challenge ourselves to really try to make really nice dishes with only plant-based stuff. And it's, it's been a real ride. Um, you know, to, to your, uh, so your point about culture, um, that's probably been the biggest challenge for us. In other words, uh, food is so culturally imbued. I mean, things like Thanksgiving and uh, what you eat on St. Patty's Day and Christmas, you know, it's just it's it's one of these things where that's so much part of our culture that that part is difficult. And we found ourselves not being invited to certain cookouts, for example, until really good, like, you know, Beyond Burgers came along or, or the Impossible Burger came along. But prior to that, you know, people just didn't invite us to cookouts because they they almost didn't know what to serve us. But, you know, we're, we're pretty good like that. We, we travel with, with our, our, our vegetable patties in a cooler and, you know, a couple bottles of wine and everything that we want. We just take it to their house and grill it. So it, it, it's not bad anymore. Eight years ago, I think it was much more of a challenge because it was still largely unknown and very much on the fringe. Um, nowadays, uh, you know, uh, going whole foods plant based is actually one of the biggest dietary trends of the day. And so it's actually very easy now as companies are coming out with more and more products. Now, that said, it's not good to exchange uh, highly refined standard products to highly refined products. Uh, plant-based products. I mean, you still try to eat as cleanly as possible, but those were what we call sort of step-down foods. In other words, when you're trying to go plant-based, but you still really want a burger, then you eat the Beyond Burger. And we've sort of gotten past that, and now we we make other things. But um, that was uh, that was very helpful, for example, for getting our kids to transition to a plant-based diet. Yeah, I I do. I know exactly what you mean. And for me, I would say it's if I. I love to make zucchini noodles. And so I like, we'll do the Beyond Burger. One of those makes meatball. And I, I put it in that because I just, and that, to me, that's like a, a a rarity that I would do, you know, use. I don't do it all the time, but it's, it, it is nice to have that kind of substance. T- kind of thinking about mental health. One of the things I've heard people talk about a lot is that when they're, focused on what they're eating, they're more intentional about what they're eating, and they have a healthier relationship with food because they're planning, they're thinking about, I'm going to eat this, and they're preparing, and they're kind of sitting down. Um, and it it that there's been ties to that to put someone's greater mental health feeling kind of just more at peace and, um, you know, just kind of a, a healthier type of relationship. And, you know, mental health is this vast, you know, spectrum where we always look at it. And, you know, we think so much about, uh, we talk a lot about in terms of mental wellness and, you know, how do you feel good or show up in your, in your day where you're trying to be, you know, more, the most resilient or, you know, really kind of just being, um, intentional about appreciating the, the good positive moments. I do think that eating healthy, in addition to all of those benefits we talked about today, really does improve your mental health because it allows you to just take a pause and, uh, you know, you create something, you enjoy it more. Absolutely. You know, uh, one of the older documentaries, Forks Over Knives, uh, that was really what turned us on to eating plant-based. And, um, you know, it was, it was, it was something that was said almost parenthetically, but someone had said in the, in the movie that when you go plant-based, a couple weeks after you've gone plant-based, you develop this sense of mental clarity. It's almost like being a kid again, or or when you show up to like a new country and and you step out of the airport and you see all the sights and you smell all the smells and everything just seems very present and you're in the moment. And, and it's something that uh, I didn't necessarily understand until we went plant-based. And I agree. I, I think there's a much, it's almost like a mental fog has been lifted. And I feel like I'm much more present. I feel like my head is a lot clearer. I, I, I don't think we're ever looking back after going plant-based. I, I, I will. I got to tell you that after I saw Forks Over Knives, I never ate meat again. I thought I was going to go into it slow, 
thought it was going to be a transition. I literally just never ate it again. So I think we might be kindred spirits on this. <laughs> but I, I also think there are so many things leading up to it, you know, intuitively we know. And and I always tell people too, as I try not to preach it, is do what's comfortable to you. And maybe like I eat fish, but I don't eat fish at home. So my thing is like, if I'm out, I'll eat some fish because I love sushi. <laughs> but, you know, and so you can do things in moderation too of whatever works with whatever works for you. And there's really no wrong answer. But it is just really interesting to think through how important it is what we put into our bodies. And then we expect this body to show up for us, whether it's clarity of the mind, you know, physical, uh, you know, just all of the things. And, and we have to take care of it because, you know, it's cliche, but we only have one. That's true. Absolutely true. So I have the last question for you. Starting from five to four to three to two to one, one being the most important, what do you regard as the most important ways to lead a high performance life in school or work, in staying healthy, and in making a life rich with relationships, meaning and purpose? Well, that's quite the question. It's a great question. Um, I, I think that in this age, age of positivity, it's really great for us to all imagine the possibilities of what we can achieve or who we wish to be. Uh, the problem with this way of thinking is that we really tend to think in terms of nebulous concepts like I want to be more successful or I want to be a better athlete. But in order to achieve these monumental tasks, I think we really have to start thinking of the specifics and we begin by eliminating bad habits that ultimately prevent us from ever reaching our goals. Olympians tend to follow several basic principles that allow them to simplify their lives and really excel. So starting with number five, don't overcommit. If you want to get into shape, for example, you start simple and you gradually increase from there. You don't want to feel overwhelmed and overburdened from the outset. The key to success is to really just make it habitual. Make it something that you say, okay, every day after work, I'm going to go for half an hour or half an hour three times a week, and you build from there. Um, it's really better to hit smaller home runs. That will give you a sense of pride and satisfaction and ultimately improve your performance. Um, number four, don't overthink. In this day of technology, we really tend to focus on things that are measurable, things like steps that we've walked or calories burned or heart rate. And in doing so, you can really drive yourself crazy and lose sight of the goal of living your best life. Instead, it's better to see the big picture, keep your goal in mind, but have fun with it. Allow your creativity and passion to really come through. Um, number three, don't over-restrict. So if you're trying to improve your diet, for example, overly restricting yourself will lead to feelings of deprivation and defiance. Um, for example, when I went to Iceland, we went to this farmhouse where uh, we were told that this was Iceland's best lamb stew. And even though I was plant-based, I was thinking to myself, when am I ever going to be in Iceland again at this farmhouse? And so I had a bowl of the lamb stew and I paid for it because my, my belly's not really used to uh, meat anymore. But, you know, it's one of those things I allow myself that when I'm in a specific situation, I'm going to allow myself those liberties because I don't want to drive myself crazy. You just don't want to make that habitual. Okay. Um, so number two, Olympians always, they, they emphasize not dwelling on the negative. So that's number two. Don't dwell on the negative. Things don't go always go our way. It's just life. But focusing on a bad outcome, feeling sorry for yourself, ruminating about what could have been or should have happened, uh, these things carry a lot of psychological weight. They're emotionally draining and ultimately the outcome can't be changed. Instead, make room in your life for things like uh, constructive things, positive things like gratitude, self-confidence, and rededication to purpose. This speaks to emotional resilience and the ability to come back stronger. This is one of the true hallmarks of what makes an Olympian. And then finally, number one, we touched upon this earlier, pivot. Perhaps no attribute is more characteristic of an Olympian than their ability to make rapid, decisive changes for the better. The typical athletic career of an Olympian is finite, and it's short. And as such, the ability to pivot for them is almost of necessity in order for them to be successful. Uh, a lot goes into this, though, the ability to pivot. Dedication, resolve, strength of character. This speaks to why Olympians are who they are. This itself is a huge topic, but really one of great interest to me as those at the highest levels of sport and business and academia, you name it, they all seem to share the same capacity to shed undesirable habits in favor of those that allow them to succeed. Dr. Chen, you're amazing. I, I knew when we started this episode, it was going to be great, but you, uh, you further surpassed our expectations. 
I think uh, a lot of really good takeaways here, um, but just really a, a good way to kind of look at true elite Olympic athletes, how they are, how they are, right? And what are all the pieces that go alongside it? And then how does that translate to us commoners like myself, who will never be an Olympic athlete or an elite athlete at all, but I still get up every day and I work out at my own, you know, at at my own pace. And I I really love the the kind of final advice too about, um, you know, you have to do things in moderation. And we talk a lot about, you know, life, we have to live life in the gray and that the black and white is really, doesn't really work. And so um, I really appreciate that, you know, those kind of words of that people have to do what's best for them too and on all of that. So thank you so much for joining us. This was wonderful. Thank you very much for having me. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed the show, drop us a review. If you haven't already, subscribe to our podcast for the latest episodes. For the latest insights, check us out at psychhub.com.